Hey and welcome. In this video, I will show you how you can really improve the accuracy of your finite element simulations by selecting the right material model for your material. And to do this, I will focus on a very specific material that's called a uh, copolyester, which is a kind of a thermoplastic elastomer, TPE. This is a relatively soft material that's used in many applications. And it has properties that are a little bit between uh, a thermoplastic and a rubber-like material. So that can cause uh, the challenges uh, in the calibration and in the material model selection. But there are some really excellent material models available for, for this type of material. And there are also a lot of commonly used material models. They don't work at all. They're really not very good. So uh, stick around and I'll show you how it works. So in this case, I will talk about uh, experimental data uh, that is shown on the screen here. I performed uh, four types of experiments. I have uniaxial tension at two different strain rates, very slow and a sort of intermediate rate. And then a uniaxial tension with a very long relaxation segment, one hour uh, uh, stress relaxation, it's about 10% strain. And then a cyclic test where I increased the strain uh, gradually and held the strain constant at 10 minutes for 10 minutes at six different levels and um, that's what i will use for my calibration here we'll take a look at many different material models to see which works and which doesn't work uh, if this is the type of data that you have and the goal of course here is to find a material model that can capture all the experimental data that's available uh, you want to have a robust model that can do this and not cause problems in your finite element simulations in the end and there are a lot of interesting and sort of surprising results coming out of this, I would say. So uh, just, let's just write, uh, jump right into it. So I'm going to start with a group of material models that are really too simple. You shouldn't use these models for this type of material. It's not working very well. It's no, no need to even consider this. But just, just for completeness, here are three of them. Uh, just a linear elastic material model. Here is uh, the predictions uh, in dashed lines here, and then the other curves are the experimental data that I talked about a minute ago. Note that linear elasticity does not give you a straight line when you plot it as engineering stress, engineering strain. Um, the maximum error in any point here is 3.18 megapascals. The, strain, the stress levels go from six to eight. So that's like 50% error at max, which is really not so good, right? You don't want a 50% error in your predicted stress. The NMAT fitness in the lower right here is the average error of all points of the prediction. So that's 24%, still not very good. Um, if you try to use a hyperelastic material model, it won't work very well either. Here's the best I could do with the Yo hyperelastic model. It's a third order polynomial type model. You see that it looks like, I don't know what, it looks really crazy, right? Um, clearly not a good model, the error is way large, not a good idea. In fact, don't use hyperelasticity beyond yield of any thermoplastic or rubber material. Um, um, the other type of model that one may consider uh, perhaps is a, a hyperelastic model with linear viscoelasticity. Uh, it doesn't work at all here. Uh, it's terrible, the predictions are not very good. And the reason for that is linear viscoelasticity should not either be used beyond yield for any uh, plastic material. So that's another example of what you shouldn't do. So what can you do? Well, you can always try to use plasticity, what I call metal plasticity models. I have a, a few selected here and uh, you can see here's the Johnson Cook plasticity model compared to the experimental data. Uh, that looks pretty good. I mean, overall, the, the, the average fitness is 7.1%. So that is the error on average is 7%. The maximum error of any point is 2.16 megapascals, which is a huge fraction of the stress values of interest. So the maximum error is not good. The average error is not too bad. So I'll come back to that later. How about an elastic plastic combined hardening? This is a multi backstress network kind of model. This is the, uh, the Abacus version. ANSYS has something similar. Um, the uh, average error is 6%. The max error is 1.43. Actually, not too bad uh, in some sense. Uh, I will talk about that compared to some of the more advanced models in a little bit. But this one was one of the surprises to me that it did this well, uh, relatively speaking. There's no rate dependence here. So that's a problem, of course. But besides that, uh, the errors are not all that terrible. 
about a mesoplasticity, multi-isotropic uh, linear hardening plasticity with creep. So this is a rate-dependent plasticity model. This is the ANSYS version of it. The average error is, is, is an elegant 4.4%. Not too bad, right? But look at the maximum error. The maximum error is 4 megapascals of this data set. It's terrible. That is, you can on average get reasonably good predictions, but the maximum error, not, not too much to be happy about. What if you want to do better than that? Well, you have to switch to viscoplasticity, uh, nonlinear viscoplasticity specifically. I'll start by two network models of this class. The most commonly used one is the model I developed, which is the Bergstrom Boyce model. The average error is 2.18%. Usually when I see 2.8% error in the model prediction, I feel very good about it. I feel like this is a pretty a good uh, representation of the average data, and it is. But the uh, maximum error of these, particularly during unloading, particularly uh, looking at the residual strain or in the, in, the, in the specimen after unloading from a finite strain, is not predicted very well. In fact, we get five megapascal in this case. It's a terrible uh, residual prediction of this model. Clearly, we can do better. How about if we activate Mullins damage? So the same BB model, but we activate Mullins damage. It doesn't do that much to, uh, for this. It actually doesn't help significantly in this case. The errors are almost the same with or without Mullins effect in this case. Not so great, but still useful perhaps if that's what you want to use, but we can do much better than this as I will show in a minute. How about an Abacus Parallel Rheological Framework, PRF model? This is a two network version of it. Uh, M calibration call it the PRF 2YP model. You can read it to the right here what that stands for. Uh, it's in essence similar to the Bergstrom Boys model, and therefore it's not going to be that great as we just talked about. It. The max errors are not good. How about the ANSYS version of the BB model? Well, it's very similar. In, in fact, of course, it's the same basis of the model, so one could then argue that it should be a similar predictions. The average error is good, the max error is not good. Activating Mullins damage still doesn't save us. We can do better, we must do better we need to go to three networks. Two networks, not good enough. How about three networks? So here's one of my favorite models. This is the three network uh, model in the PolyUMod library. It has a, a average error of 2.1%. Pretty darn good. You see the curves now look very good, even during unloading. The maximum error of any point here is 0 0.86 megapascals. So far, the best we've seen, right? This is something you can start living with, I guess. This is not too bad. Can we do even better? Yeah, we can. We can switch on to a newer version of that model that I call the TNV model, the three network viscoplastic model. Again, it's part of the polyumod library. Um, in this case, the average fitness is 1.57 megapascal. Fantastic. One, no, I'm sorry, 1.57%. But the average the max error is 1.2, so it's not all that different than the TN model. But this one doesn't have Mullins. If I kick in the Mullins effect with this model, so I just add the calibration to include that, I get an uh, average error of 1.45%, and the maximum error is 0.87 megapascals. It looks really good. This is, in fact, the best model that I have found in this uh, exercise, and uh, this is the one that will be the winner, as we will see in a little bit. How about the PRF model? Here's a three network PRF model uh, with two, three networks, uh, power law flow and Mullins damage. It is not that good. The, the, the NMAD fitness is 2.2%. So typically you would say that's great, but look at the unloading. The unloading response is quite wrong. And it, it's, a, it's an issue, not with the, the type of uh, real, uh, rheological framework, but the, the equations to go into the, the PRF model doesn't have the damage or the, the back stress correctly. Correctly is the wrong word perhaps, but it doesn't do it it's in such a way that it matches the data very well. So the maximum error for this PRF model, which is one of my favorite PRF models in general, is three megapascal. Not so good, Not clearly not nearly as good as the T and V model that we just talked about. How about four network models? I virtually never use a four network model. If you use a four network model, in this case, you get an average error of 1.67, percent not too bad the average the max error is still three megapascals didn't help that and that's because the issue with the unloading has to do with the type of equations that are used not the number of networks you can't fix this by adding more networks 
you have a bad prediction of the residual strain. It can be a very large prediction uh, of the residual strain, but in fact, the material recovers much more. Not too cool, not uh, always what you want to do. So let's summarize. Here is a figure that shows the average error as a function of material. The first three one I said don't use. You see the errors are tremendously large. We don't need to worry about those. If we zoom in and remove those, this is what it looks like. The red curves, uh, red bars here are the plasticity models. Again, they are not as good as the green ones, which are two network viscoplastic models. The blue ones are three network viscoplastic models, and the uh, pink one here is the four network. The plasticity models are not as good in terms of average error. I would not use them because of that. You can use them if that's all you have, but they're certainly not going to be the best. So we get rid of those and we zoom in on even smaller uh, errors here. We see in this case, um, this is the average error. The plasticity models are outside the scale here. Here's the two networks. Models are relatively okay, right? But they're not as good as the three networks for the average error. The winner is the polyuma TNV model. Another way to plot this, which I think is the most interesting plot in, in this uh, uh, video, is this one. It shows the error in the stress um, as a function of model. And these bars have a maximum value, which is uh, the max error of any point in the prediction. And then at the bottom is the average error. So the average error is very good for many models, but many models have a terrible maximum error. So the two network plus this viscoplastic models, they have av maximum errors that are, uh, exceeds about 50%. You can get the prediction that's 50% wrong. Who wants that, right? Um, and the, the PRF models are also not very good. They have a maximum error that's close to 40%. Again, not very cool. The winner is the TNV model. The T and the model is also good, but they're not quite as good in terms of the, the, um, the average error, which is slightly better for the uh, three, uh, TNV model. But that's the model that I would recommend for this kind of material. It is very good both for on average, can capture everything very well, but it also has a very robust maximum error. The maximum error is not something you need to be worried about. It can capture all of these predictions, all of this data at once. So uh, that's the recommended model for this class of materials. Thank you.